Welcome to SMA's Southern Medicine Podcast. Practicing medicine in the southeastern United States presents unique challenges for healthcare professionals. The South's heavily rural population and limited resources require medical professionals to be more resourceful in their approach to providing quality care. SMA's Southern Medicine Podcast addresses these issues by drawing on the experience of healthcare leaders who provide a multi-specialty, interdisciplinary team approach to medicine for the purpose of providing better care for the Southern patient population. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Andy Mohan, and I'm the co-chairman of the Digital Health and Innovation Committee. We have a great guest for you all today who is a a surgeon out of this great state of Illinois. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to quickly introduce Ms. Jennifer Price, who is the Educational Manager of the Southern Medical Association, and will be one of the moderators for this discussion, along with myself and a special guest moderator. I would like to also introduce Mr. D Dylan Stevenson, who is our Digital Media Specialist here at the Southern Medical Association. So today, we also have a guest moderator joining us. I'd like to introduce Mr. Fred Newmark. Mr. Newmark has 17 years of experience in healthcare consulting, recruiting, medical staff planning and development. His background includes recruiting oversight of 24 hospitals within a large healthcare system, vice president of recruitment for a national emergency medicine, hospitals medicine company, and operations manager for a large national recruiting agency. Fred also created a residency outreach education program to assist residents with their post-training job search process. Talks included CV, CV preparation, effective interviewing techniques, how to select and work with recruiters, understanding compensation models, leveraging value and contract negotiation. Fred now consults as a co-founder and managing partner of Newmark Healthcare Services, working with physicians and hospitals and group practices. He also has a video series called Behind the Curtain of Healthcare, that can be found on YouTube. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Our main guest we have joining us today doctor, is Dr. Muhammad Ayub Ilyas. Dr. Ayub is a colorectal and general surgeon and is employed at HSHS, which is Hospital Sisters Health System, St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital in Effingham, Illinois. He is a board certified physician in general surgery and colon and rectal surgery. Before we begin, I would like to encourage our listeners to visit sma.org forward slash podcast to subscribe to the Southern Medicine Podcast, as well as other SMA podcasts. Dr. Ayub, uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you again for joining us, Mr. Newmark. Uh, before Mr. New, uh, Newmark digs into Dr. Ayub's experiences on the front line of this pandemic, I just want to start by asking you both, both of you guys, how are things with you, your family during this, uh, this pandemic crisis going on right now? and with the craziness. Uh, doctor, are you, would you uh, care to comment on that please? Our life has changed quite a bit and every aspect of our life has changed. The time when we sleep has changed. The time you see our patients have changed and the way we interact with our patient change. So life has changed. Yeah, no, no doubt, doctor. I, you, I work from home anyway, my home office, but uh, clearly, we're now into a new normal phase, as uh, many call it. Um, I am personally in the at-risk uh, demographic. I'll be 63 in June. No comorbidity uh -huh. issues, but uh, we have uh, young friends, if you will, doing our grocery shopping. Uh, we are taking this to heart and very seriously for the social distancing. So pretty much, we, we've been homebound. We take a few walks outside, but um, my wife and I pretty much are, are, are abiding by the strictest of guidelines uh, from uh, our healthcare professionals. Yeah. Yeah. And on a, on a funny side, you know, uh, I'm a colorectal surgeon and a robotic surgeon, and pretty much uh, all my major cases are done robotically. The reason I'm saying that is I wish I can put the robotic console in my bedroom and sit in my bedroom and operate. You know what I mean? We haven't. Yeah. Literally, the idea behind getting robotic surgery is so that surgeons don't have to be very close to the patient, uh, but we haven't really implemented it. You know what I mean? I wish if we had really implemented it, it would be very convenient for me. Hey, there, there's no yeah. doubt that the, the new new down the road, uh, which uh, could, could expand this whole conversation. I know we want to kind of focus on COVID, but 
I, I anticipate so many things from telemedicine and things changing over time just based on on what we're all experiencing. So if, if we keep it to your particular scope of practice, uh, Dr. Ayub, of how the COVID-19 pandemic has has impacted surgical practices both you know across the country on a national scale and then personally for you in your everyday practice. Like I said earlier, it has impacted every aspect of our life in the, every businesses across the country. And the healthcare, uh, healthcare sector is one of the largest business or entity across the country. And that's, that's affected probably more than anybody else. We all had to reorganize our personal and professional life, how we see patients, how we run the hospitals, uh, within the hospital system, within the state, across the country, sharing resources, and so on. In the, for particularly for healthcare workers, it has everyday life has become a new entity, which is massively increased risk for all of us. Just going to work, and hospitals have to suddenly come up with thousands and thousands of beds, hundreds of ICUs. We had to bring in what INS Mercy and INS uh, Comfort to New York and Los Angeles. It's 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 completely changed. We, you know, as healthcare professionals, as doctors, right? We over centuries we've been tuned to putting in all our money effort to improve quality of life, so that the patients get the best possible care. The, long, the longest longevity, the shortest to stay in the hospital, minimal pain and all, that's our goal. And mm -hmm. now we are in triage mode. We are like keeping pitch, we are not doing tests, only for barely essential people. And if you are unfortunately positive with COVID, we can't admit you because we don't want to have you in the hospital. We want to have you only if you cannot stay at home. Yeah. So our our thresholds have changed, our goals have changed. And the same thing applies to every specialty as well. And how it has affected individual specialties depending on that type of interactions you have. A psychiatrist uh, 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 talks a lot to a patient. A surgeon has to examine the patient. And also where is your hospital located? Which city, which town are you in? Which state are you in? Which, where do you belong in the curve? How much has the pandemic or epidemic has affected your town? Could we all behave like a single unit and follow the same rules? Or should we all behave like different rules? So are you yes, finding yes. that uh, being colorectal surgeon, <clears throat> are you finding for you personally and or other colleagues that have other specialties that they've trained in and provide care in having to, in some way, the word comes to mind for me, Dr. Ayub, is cross cover. I'm just curious, have you been asked or have you proactively volunteered in some way to deliver your your care in areas just because it's like an all hands on deck sort of approach? It, are, are doctors being asked to kind of work in spaces that maybe they wouldn't traditionally work in under normal circumstances? Yeah, this is a very relevant question. And I'm part of a 15 hospital, two state healthcare system. And uh, this pandemic is, uh, you know, like the whole healthcare sector is terrified. And we wanted to prepare our best. We had a little bit of a lag time, like, well, like it, it started in China, but we had a lag time. I'm, I wish we had prepared for this more. Mm -hmm. Now, what? Uh, one of the most important things are healthcare workers, doctors, and nurses, uh, in that amount of the human resources, how much do we have of it? And, uh, you, know, to, you know, the way I see it is primary care providers in the community, the ER doctors in the front line, you know, the front of the hospital, and the ICU doctors inside the hospital fighting this uh, hard. These are the three groups of people primarily involved, but that mm -hmm. amount of personnel involved is limited. We never had excess ER doctors. 
or exercise doctors or exercise nurses to, or spare nurses. So all of us have to pitch in. And right now, I the place where I practice is between St. Louis, one red hot spot, and Chicago, another hot spot. But we have some cases. And as the hospital system, we have right now made a decision to go to the tertiary care, fill in those patients at the tertiary care hospital, which is Springfield for us. So a lot of our patients are being transferred to Springfield. We are terrified of the surge. So we all are preparing for the surge. So we have made a list. Our med medical group has reached out to us asking for who is willing to volunteer and uh, to fill in the roles as needed. And what kinds of roles would that be without affecting uh, our own patients? Because just because we have COVID doesn't mean uh, rest of my patients are going to stay home and they're going to have their problems. You know, every week mm -hmm. I have to be operating on patients with cancer and mm -hmm. who's going to take care of them. And it is also at the same time when the pandemic goes on, we'll have to ensure the safety of the personnel managing the pandemic epidemic so that they are also available to take care of the patient after we get hold of this pandemic. Do you feel that you guys uh, have adequate uh, PPE or personal protective equipment uh, within your hospital when these guys are going in? And number two, has anybody else been, or do you know of personnel within your, your hospital system that have been diagnosed with COVID-19? I mean, uh, uh, I'm in Illinois, and across my, I mean, I can give you uh, uh, within my county, adjacent counties, and uh, my hospital system is in two different states. Both states have thousands of patients. And probably within the 15 hospitals, they may be dealing with hundreds of thousands of patients. And uh, like me being in the Midwest in a, in a rural hospital predominantly, we are able to transfer a lot of our suspected patients under investigation of positive patients to our mothership hospital, what we call it is in Springfield. And regarding PPE, nobody is in the comfort zone. Nobody is within the comfort zone. And uh, for instance, uh, this is a, a huge answer. It's not a simple yes or no answer, but the, the upshot is nobody is within the comfort zone. We are doing things which we never did. So for instance, uh, I do a lot of long operations, okay? And uh, when I do a six hour operation or eight hour operation, when I have to take a bathroom break, I just tear off my glove. I mean, I mean not just a glove, the mask, and then walk into the bath restroom and come back because I don't want to walk into the restroom with the same mask and come back to the operating room again. Now, yesterday, what did I do? I put a sheet on top of the bed and removed my mask and kept it on the bed and then went to the bathroom, used my restroom, and then came back and wore the same mask. I would never do that. So we are trying to conserve resources. Why are we doing that? Because, like I said, we are terrified of the surge. One of the hospital medical directors said, be conscious of the fact if, when, if we get to a situation where we need a N95 mask, if it, it, and that is not available just because we weren't very frugal earlier, that will affect your confines. It's like scaring the hell out of the other person. So we are trying to be uh, uh, conscious of the fact and terrified of the surge. That's what we are waiting for. And uh, hope we don't, our surge is not worse. So the PPE issue is prevalent across the country. The intensity of the issue is different at different levels. Like I said, that's why I want to I want to go back and say, man, I wish we had prepared better for this than we are now. So, Dr. Ayub, um, my understanding is, pr hopefully, around the country, most, if not practically all, hospitals have um, shut down most elective things, elective surgeries, things that maybe were not emergent that were planned for some time. How are you dealing or what is your communication with uh, patients with surgical conditions at this point? Uh, what is your advice to them? What should they do? Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, situation uh, because uh, uh, bottom line is the philosophy of surgery is if you have been advised surgery by someone, it is essential. 
uh, nobody should do non-essential surgeries. You know, I'm not talking about cosmetic surgeries because I don't do them. So now the question comes, so by default, everything is essential. So, but the, no, but the question comes is now, what is urgent? What is emergent? What is elective? And when will the elective turn into urgent or emergent? Mm -hmm. Or how much risk do you want to put someone from an elective situation and transitioning him into an urgent situation, into an emergent situation? And now, you know, elective surgeons, elective surgeries, as you could, uh, could uh, uh, as you would probably know, has the best outcome. In emergent operation, not as good an outcome compared to elective surgery because the philosophy is different, right? Emergent operation, like we come into saving life becomes most important. So uh, these are all the things need to be taken into account. So uh, I deal with the cancer surgery patients, right? And if someone has a bowel cancer, or rectal cancer, or colon cancer, and just the thought of having a cancer, you want it to take in, you want to have the cancer taken out within the next possible opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if I ask them, if I tell them, hey, your cancer is early cancer, cancer is cancer for the patient. I try to convince them, it's early cancer, let's wait for a few weeks. It's not an easy discussion to have with them. Yeah. And there are a lot of precancerous conditions where you need surgery so that the cancer is either early cancer or it, it would develop into cancer in the future. And how long could you make them wait? So these are all uh, difficult scenarios. So what I do is I talk with the patient, talk with them in detail about it, go over, give them a lot of facts, mm -hmm. and help them make a decision so that the decision comes principally from their side. You know, uh, like for instance, I had someone had a, a precancerous polyp with or without an early cancer. And he had to have an operation a few weeks ago. And we talked all about it. And he said, you have the risk of COVID virus infection while in the hospital. Yeah. And also we are trying to save resources for the community, for the society, so that they need mm -hmm. patients. And it's been like three weeks. And he had to come and see me yesterday. And he's already worked up. He's nervous. That's affecting his life. He says, no, I had to have this operation. So I had to do his operation. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's different in different scenarios. Like, for instance, acute appendicitis. I, I do general surgery calls from ER calls. Acute appendicitis. Not all appendicitis need to be operated. There are some studies which shows, you know, you can treat appendicitis with medications, with antibiotics only. But that's still not the standard of care. But now somebody comes with appendicitis. And what are we going to talk to them? Are we going to give them off of the uh, surgery? There are two dimensions in this. One, you are consuming the resources from the hospital. That is number one. Number two is whether the patient is COVID positive or not. If he or she doesn't have any symptoms, and are they asymptomatic COVID positive? If they are asymptomatic COVID positive, I'm exposing the entire operating room personal to them. Yeah. So what kind of a precautions we take? And how much risk we let patient take? How much risk should I take? How much risk should I let my entire operating room take? So it's, it's a very complex uh, situation. And uh, it would be good to know the, uh, the COVID status of the patient. Like in the past, when HIV came up, we always had a point of care HIV test for everybody in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of places. It's not universal to get it done before surgery. So that people, you know what? Uh, this person has HIV positive, so we all take more care. Not that yes. we should take less care in other patients, but we wish we had a point of care uh, uh, test that is coming. So our knowledge of this virus is improving. Our tools in the armamentarium is improving. Testing tools, diagnostic tools, and treatment tools are improving day by day. We are getting better at it, but I think at least we are a good few weeks to months from it to at least safely say. So as we progress, and I gotta, I gotta appreciate, like, you know, uh, uh, Sages is a society of American gastro, uh, gastrointestinal surgeon endoscopic surgery, and American College of Surgeons. 
and the CDC and NIH, they do in a general, generically, but these two organizations and other organizations as well have been helping us to cope with the situation, giving us guidelines regarding this so that we make it both safe for the patient and safe for the personnel involved in the care of the patient. So if somebody presents for what deems uh, the patient feels the surgery is needed now, or that's your perspective, uh, being that there's no readily available, to my understanding, COVID-19 tests that can give results in a relatively short period of time, what what do you do at this point? What are your steps to, if any, to try to ensure that are they asymptomatic? Are there risks to your point that you could be putting yourself at or your your team in the OR? Is there anything you're able to do at this point? As a scientific person, every doctor is a scientist within himself, like himself or herself. And uh, when I know 25, 30% of the patients are asymptomatic carriers, I got to assume everybody is positive, mm -hmm. unless proved otherwise. Uh, so what I do is I have already instructed and uh, trying to make it as a hospital policy that everybody who is exposed or who is involved in the care of the patient wears an N95 mask, but that has not become a norm as yet because of the TPE shortage. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the question is, if there are a few other dimensions to this question. Like for instance, first, if you need surgery, you need to be intubated or you need to be put under sleep. Correct. Putting anesthesia is what we call as aerosolizing procedure, meaning uh, uh, if the virus within the trachea can go as water vapor, within the water vapor, the virus could be there. It puts everybody in the operating room at harm's way. Mm -hmm. And they breathe, they can get the virus. So we have ensured how to safely intubate these patients. Now we take, ensure uh, a standard precautions for everybody so that we assume everybody is passed. But, and then now the second part is surgery. What is the risk of exposure to virus? Uh, during surgery. So like I said, I do 99, 100% of my cases using keyholes or robotic or laparoscopic. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the same because we use air within the belly and we put tiny holes and do the surgery. And there are uh, uh, suspicion and clinical reports of the virus being in the air. So when I put carbon dioxide in somebody's belly, inflate the belly, do the operation, and if the air leaks from the side, in the past, we never used to care about it because it's just CO2. But now, it could be CO2 with some viruses in it. Yes. Wow. Now I'm worried. Now I put an N95 mask. And if I'm sitting, you know, surgery is usually not a, a you know, a playing field. You know, it's a stressful environment. And uh, eight hours, six hour surgery and wearing an N95 mask and doing the surgery is not comfortable as well. And communicating is a problem because my nurses don't understand what I'm talking. I'm, I, first of all, I have an accent, too, uh, and depends on my mood or how I talk, you know, maybe subtle or maybe yelling, or, or, uh, and then I'm in between is the N95 mask in between. So uh, the communications become a problem. Mm -hmm. And then even how, to, how do you deflate it? Where does this air go? Does it go into a conventional suctioning pathway or does it have to go to a specific filter? This is where the surgical societies have been helping us to come up with guidelines how to reduce the risk. And uh, then they said, if, if there's so much of risk, why don't you do open operation? We all know open operation means more pain, a more length of stay. The outcomes are good, but not as good as a, a, a minimally invasive operation. And then again, the smoke from the plume of open operation is in direct uh, 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 against my face as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, the science is evolving about it. But right now we are taking uh, extreme precautions to the level possible within the limitation of PPE shortage. What's your advice for the general population about the current epi epidemic? <sighs> you know, uh, uh, it is, uh, we are all in it together, right? And for our own sake. We are social animals. Human beings are social animals. 
yari yari we have a social responsibility and we have to follow all these guidelines yari yari and all but even for selfish reasons we we'll have to follow the guidelines so better follow the guidelines why because you know traditionally we've been saying for the last few weeks that all the people comorbid patients with comorbidities are higher risk but the data from italy and then data from new york city in new orleans show that about you know more than a quarter of patients are younger patients between 20 and 60 a lot of them are on ventilators a lot of very fit healthcare workers very athletic doctor or on ventilators i know of so it affects every age group in the community and the you know the herd immunity will develop and yeah so why don't we get infected and develop immunity so that we don't have to worry about it yes by the time the herd immunity develops on we are all at risk for this infection we will somehow at some time will get potentially infected by this we were going to be exposed so let's get exposed to now but the reason is that we want to delay for our own personal reasons to get infected uh personally getting infected to a later phase of the process you know why because the doctors will know more about the disease the doctors will have more medications for this disease the hospitals will have more ventilators waiting for you if you get sick rather than the other way around so it is very important for your own personal safety the safety of your family let alone the social responsibility community country world as a whole that you follow the guidelines it's very you know the, the the logic is very simple this virus doesn't have legs the virus does not move you move the virus we people are going to move the virus when you are socially going to be just going to live the way you be live we are going to move the virus from one place one household to another household one hospital department to another hospital department one supermarket to another supermarket one town to another one country to another so it's very simple we reduce our mobility do the bare minimal essential till the guidelines are relaxed and then we will be able to reduce the impact of this virus and not have the surge and not have to do the unthinkable things we had to do in new york city with patients waiting on the ventilator mm -hmm. uh, doctor ayub as this uh, subsides um you know we to mitigate the risk and we're all we all uh, obviously a lot of us and everybody wants to go back to work at some point and we need to do that from an economic standpoint for uh, our country um do you think it would be something that would be best if there is some sort of if you go outside of your house you have to wear a mask type of mandate uh that number one and what do you what are your thoughts on hydroxychloroquine and when should something like that be given based on your knowledge of the medication sure there are uh, there are a few parts to this question i'm going to answer the hydroxychloroquine part later because I have taken chloroquine many times in my life. I'll answer that last. It's an important part of the question. And then the economic impact. You know, I'm going to quote. You know, in the in the, in, the, in the, I don't know who said that. Uh, someone said, "Is the economy stupid?" You know what I mean. And but now it's not the economy stupid. It's the healthcare. You fix the virus. You fix the healthcare, and the economy will follow. And the million dollar question is. how do we handle it how do we quarantine it is it going to be universal quarantine precautions for everybody or you know because we belong in different parts of the curve how do we keep the country going can we implement different restrictions for different parts of the society cities towns counties states regions that is a, a, a million dollar question or more than that a trillion dollar question now and that we all of our social scientists expert minds have to sit and work it out regarding masks uh i all personally always felt okay i've been using mask for a long time and uh, 
but I, I, I personally somehow feel CDC has been uh, a few weeks late in every of their recommendations. If, for instance, the recommendation, I think it's a Czech Republic and one more, South Korea, uh, if I'm not wrong, Sing not Singapore, South Korea and Czech Republic, they implemented mask outside, uh, I don't know how mandatory it is, but it's very easy to probably have Asian uh, community in South, uh, South Korea to follow the rules rather than probably because we have a lot of freedom out here. So it does have an impact. Very simple. You, these, the, the, this virus does transmit through droplet, and there is question about aerosol, or there is evidence to suggest there is aerosol transmission. But we don't want to accept it completely because one, I see, will be more terrified. Two, I see, we don't have enough PPEs to, main, to maintain aerosol precautions for everybody. That's why, you see, we don't want to accept that possible fact. So, but then the droplet transmission, like if, for instance, if, God forbid, if I have COVID, and if I go to Walmart, I'm going to shop, and when I talk, the droplets can go. If I'm on the phone to my wife, hey, shall I pick this? Shall I pick that? I'm putting some droplets around some of the vegetables, maybe. And you come in, and he comes in half an hour later, picks up the banana and goes home. That's transmission complete. So by putting a mask in, I am not transmitting to others, rather than somebody else's virus come to me because virus needs an N95 filter to come into you to prevent you from getting it. But a cloth mask, as a regular mask, even a surgical mask would not stop you. But if you, Andy and me, both of us have a mask and both are off at the Walmart at the same time, we won't be giving to each other if both of us have a mask. So it's significantly, in my opinion, okay, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm not a virologist, I'm a low-lying surgeon, but I, in my opinion, I think it reduces the risk significantly. And uh, now coming back to chloroquine. There are, you know, uh, I've been involved in a lot of online discussion with these doctors about, you know, because we have read a lot in our med school times, and I'm sure uh, Andy knows it, pharmacology, microbiology, virology, and all those things are now coming back to my back of my mind and trying to understand this virus more. Why is it affecting certain people? Like, for instance, now we know it's affecting a lot more African Americans. Yes, there is some explanations for it because uh, they have more comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, you know, uh, poverty issues, yaddy yaddy. But they also have sickle cell disease. That's a, a disease which affects the blood cells, and it's prevalent more in the in in the, in the black community. And I know Iran had a lot of mortality, and there is beta thalassemia, another blood cell disorder that is prevalent there. And I'm trying I'm trying to find out. Hey, when we do know that the, the, the respiratory distress syndrome, what we call it acute respiratory distress syndrome, which presents, which is the main uh, uh, life-threatening event with COVID virus, presents very differently compared to a sepsis-induced ARDS. And that is because of this. And there's a lot of people with very low oxygen saturation in COVID uh, are conscious compared to normally when you see like that. And that is because of this explanation. There's a lot of puzzles around. Somebody, I wish I'm, I'm a scientist who's spending more time in the lab now than in my operating room because I could potentially save lives more that way. And I'm sure there are thousands and thousands of scientists are working on My own brother, he's a genetic scientist. He's working on it. He's, he's working on the genomics uh, uh, aspect of this. And there are thousands and thousands of bright minds are working on this. We will have to solve this puzzle. And why am I saying this now? Because the chloroquine seems to have an impact in this hemoiety and uh, the oxidase system and so on. And so could we take chloroquine? And so there are three questions. Who should take? Can we take it as a prophylaxis? What are the side effects? When I was in med school, this was in west coast of India, a city called Mangalore, and I med school for five and a half years. And during those five and a half years, I had 
malaria 13 times. And what I do when I get shivers, fever with shivers and chills, I go to the lab, give blood for testing malaria, and take chloroquine right there. Right after I give blood, I take chloroquine. I do know, like we have to take four, four, two, 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 uh, and uh, we used to take double strength tablets, 10 tablets, and then take uh, mefloquine after that to prevention. So my personal experience with chloroquine, it's not a pleasant drug to take. It causes a lot of itching, and it is a cumulative effect. The more you keep taking, it has, creates a lot of itching and photophobia. There are other side effects of chloroquine with uncommon side effects as well. But in COVID situation, hydroxychloroquine is a little milder form of chloroquine. And a lot of patients do take hydroxychloroquine for psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. They've been taking them for a life, I mean, a long time, months and years. And it is a standard prescribed medication. Uh, the, the studies about hydroxychloroquine are not great because a study from uh, France uh, or Italy, it's, I think it's a French study, that there's a lot of questionable aspect to that study. And there are a few other studies that have since come up as well. They are showing some promise, but we as scientists want to look at the best possible evidence, like level one evidence, we call it randomized study. But our philosophy in life has changed now. We are now not doing to get the best outcome. We are now trying to only say, can we now wait for level one studies? Maybe not. So can we accept studies with a lower level of evidence? Maybe now, yes. So it's, it's, it's again a question for the scientists and the bright minds in the country. But uh, we could potentially take hydroxychloroquine because uh, if it comes to the situation where you have nothing, a lot of the hospitals or most of the hospitals are now using hydroxychloroquine. Now, could we use this for preventative reasons? Uh, I know I'm, from, I'm originally from India. Indian Council of uh, Medical Research, ICMR, advocates chloroquine for prophylaxis in India. My parents in India, they are in their late 60s, my dad is close to 70, and they are taking it. I'm, 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 I'm from a family of three other doctors. So they have asked them to take. That is ICMR recommendation. They are in India. My brothers are in India as well. They made them take, and they are taking it. Indians are used to it, taking chloroquine as well. There is one hospital system in our country as well which is, if I'm not wrong, Henry Ford Health System in Detroit is giving chloroquine as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers this, as, as, a, as a study. So we need to, I'm, I was going to actually try and see if there are any early outcomes from that study. Has anyone fallen ill? It's not going to be a 0% healthcare worker getting infected just because they started taking chloroquine. I'm sure there's going to be, but is there any positive effect? yet to see. But the catch point is this. When you, in COVID, chloroquine is given with azithromycin, z -pack. And chloroquine can cause some EKG change called QT pro prolongation. Azithromycin also causes it. Whenever you have two medications, both cause same side effects, they become additive. They may not be some medicine, it could multiply, the effect could multiply. That could lead to life-threatening cardiac complications. So if you need to take azithromycin and chloroquine, it has to be done after some investigations or with close monitoring or under observation in the hospital. So it is an evolving scenario. I sincerely hope there is some promise with chloroquine, but we are yet to see a level one evidence for it. And again, we are all learning every day as we move on with this epidemic or pandemic. There's two things that uh, stick out in my head. First of all, you had malaria 13 times. That's uh, yeah. that very large. Are you, are you sleeping with mosquitoes or Anopheles uh, mosquitoes? Or what's going on here, Dr. Ayu? 
Uh, no, 13, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like West Coast of India is like flooded with mosquitoes. Whatever uh, you do, you know, uh, I don't know. I know you did medicine from Chennai, but uh, yeah, yeah. the mosquito coil is a billion dollar industry there. Mosquito <laughs> oil, mosquito cream, anti-mosquito cream is a billion dollar industry. But I'll tell right. you the story. With that uh, being said, you know, because you, uh, you're in India, you grew up there. I'm assuming you grew up there, correct? You grew up in India. Um, you, yeah, for a, given, about 45 uh, years. I don't know when you're mm -hmm. born, but they give the BCG vaccine, the Bacillus calmette guerra uh -huh. vaccine, which is the TB yeah. vaccine. And recently yeah. they've come out with some articles stating that BCG might be protective. And, and it's substantially protective over COVID-19 in terms of... Uh, getting the disease or getting the virus um is it something do you feel like this is something that we need to maybe this vaccine may be beneficial if people get this vaccine at this point no uh, you know getting a bcg vaccine at this point i i mean uh, i don't think it'll help but yeah. let me let me tell you why this theory is being floated okay uh it may not be it may even be silly but or does it have any relevance this theory is being floated because we are all wondering why India doesn't have so many patients because India is 1.3 billion population. Why do they have less patients? It could be a simple explanation that they are very early in their curve. They are doing very few testing. I know that the tests are not available. Private, no private testing available. The very limited government testing in India. The simple explanation could be uh, this has no role a BCG has no role at all. India is going to have an explosive number of cases, God forbid. But we will know in the next three or four weeks how India is doing. But India has implemented strict uh, quarantine and uh, social distancing and pretty much the whole country on lockdown. So it's going to help very significantly. But again, let's not forget there is community transmission in India. Why am I saying that? Because to my knowledge, majority, if not all, the most majority of Indian population have received the BCG. You are born, I think the next day or the same day you get my get your BCG. My first child was, we were living in England, but we had a childbirth in India. The next day or the same day, my first daughter got a BCG. And so pretty much everybody gets BCG. If that is the case, if BCG is protective, why are so much of community transmission going on in India now? But Simple things are simple. I mean, it's, 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 it's a simple concept in terms. Nothing is absolutely protection. You know, it doesn't have a protective response, absolutely. So does it have some protective value? We will know in the coming weeks. There are other theories are also being floated, like ivermectin. It, this is a anti-parasitic medications for like worms, which are seen in, in third world countries and African countries. We give them for, that seem to have an in vitro effect on the virus and also i was talking to uh, my brother today and he said that's very awesome and uh, and a blood transfusion one you need a blood transfusion and an iv iron kind of uh, uh, that is being given and there are uh, i i see that that is a registered trial in an united states but it's being performed in other parts of the country other parts of the world so they're giving iv iron and they you need a blood so there's a lot of theories being floated. And uh, like I said, I wish we had used those, the first part of the three months uh, in, a, in a better way than we, like the way we are doing now, rather than now. So, so the evidence is evolving. We will know in the coming weeks and months how protective is BCG, how protective is higher temperature, tropical climate, like what is going on in Africa, what is the role of ivermectin, what is the role of chloroquine, and so on. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's more of an explanation rather than an answer. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's because uh, we, we know very less compared to many other viruses. A lot of our, lot of our information about these viruses is extrapolated from other viruses, similar viruses. Dr. Ayub, let me ask if I could, mm -hmm. um, and I mm -hmm. know we're probably running long in this uh, this mm -hmm. conversation, but how do you, in your mind, have you thought through how you see the epidemic phasing out by way of um, returning to work, returning 
society somewhat to, let's just say, a more normal uh, way of living, economic, uh, you know, going back to work, going outside. Have you given much thought to that? What seems to be a logical slash scientific way of actually returning somewhat to something that we used to think of as normal? We are going through a difficult phase. The answer to this virus is a vaccine. The, uh, a vaccine would help us to come back to near normalcy. But this pandemic has helped the entire humanity to know a lot about pandemics and viruses. So we'll be more prepared. The only good thing I see from this pandemic is we'll be prepared better for future pandemics. In the, I do see, I mean, in my opinion, at least, this pandemic is going to run for a good few months, if not for a year. Hopefully for a few months. Definitely not weeks. It's going to be a few months. And then uh, uh, a few things will improve this. One is the herd immunity. It's the general population developing immunity. That way the virus finds it difficult to spread because even if the virus is carried from one person to another, if the other person is immune, he stops it there. You know what I mean? So that herd immunity will gonna help. That is gonna happen when significant section of the population is infected, which is like 60, 70% of the population have to be infected. Second is availability of more medications, antiviral medications or, uh, or other antiviral medications, which will affect either affect the virus or the impact of the virus on us. Third is the vaccine. But in the long run, once we get this under control, once vaccine is available, we should be able to get back to our near normal life. But it is less likely to be exactly the same because our behaviors may be different. Mm -hmm. I was talking to one other person who is now working from home and most of the employers are now going to be looking at, yeah, if I'm able to get into work from home and pay less, why don't I do this for good? Yeah. So, you know, things like that. And yeah. people are becoming more creative. They are coming up with, there are more 3D printers are being put to use now than ever. And uh, maybe more people will be interested in science and STEM subjects now than before, which is a good thing. You know what I mean? So these are all the things from our day-to-day uh, -day life, things may be changing in the coming weeks and months. And uh, yeah, maybe a lot of kids may be doing homeschooling as well. So I think what I heard was testing, 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 because to figure out that we've hit that 60 to 70% range, it has, to be, it has to be determined and validated through testing. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes, and uh, you know uh, that the relevance of the testing has uh, also is changing as we going through the process, disease process. But now, what is happening is in the early stages, it was a lot more important than it is now, because once the disease becomes more prevalent, you know, for instance, uh, in February, if someone were to have a similar symptoms. Testing is more important because I'm not going to think he or she has COVID. Now, with the symptomatology, as we know of, somebody is going to have those symptoms. I'm going to consider that patient as positive, even if the test becomes negative, because I do know that 30% of the test is negative mm -hmm. as of now available. And the test, at least for now, I know there is a turnaround time of 78 days. So what am I going to do for that patient for 78 days? So I'm going to take it for granted. So the importance of testing has decreased. Like I say, you know, it, uh, you know the, 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 the saying, justice delayed is justice denied. Tre I'd say treatment delayed is treatment denied. Like I, I tell finally in my operating room, if I ask for an instrument, they, they don't give it to me or they give it to me after a minute. I say an instrument delayed is instrument denied. <laughs> Similarly, <laughs> a, a testing delayed is testing denied, you know, you lose the relevance of that as well, you know, so uh, uh, we still need to make it, a testing has a lot of relevance still because we need to still test everybody like with, like if, uh, oh God forbid, like if you have a, a streptococcal throat, you know, we get to have tests, a flu test 
or uh, you know a typhoid a malaria test or whatever test we do you know like that it should be freely available we should make it because we are we sent people to moon in 1969 this is 2020 we should have a test for this virus and we knew about this virus since december 2019 this yeah. country is the most you know powerful enriched filled with you know million phds in this country we should be better in our world we should be helping others not asking others to help us so that is important Doctor, Doctor, are you I'm I'm thinking uh -huh. I might be the only one on this uh, this podcast who was alive in 1969. <laughs> oh, uh, I remember I'm sorry, that day. I, I remember that day. I was, actually, I was oh, born in 1976. Well, so how old are you? Fred called the summer of '69. I think Bruce Springsteen uh, named it after you. Is that correct, Fred? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll, be, so I'll, be, I'll be 63 in June. So. Yes, oh, okay. I, I had a feeling I was the elder statesman, older, elder <laughs> statesman, at least biologically on this call. <laughs> uh, but, but don't worry, all of us are at risk. You know, they used to mislead, uh, saying that the older you are, the higher risk. No, I disagree with that. Yes. Yeah, and he's at as much risk as I am. Is You know, uh, so uh, one more thing about the testing is uh, just to complete it. You know, the antibody testing, it's very important. And... Uh, uh, we need to figure out who is immune to this yes, and how far this immunity lasts. You know, just because, you know, for instance, hepatitis B, we don't have a, a vaccine for hepatitis C even now, uh, but a hepatitis B, we have vaccines. Healthcare workers in a lot of places get vaccines and we check our immunity levels and then boost our immunity every eight years or five years or three years, depending on the regulations we give them. So, Similarly, because I'm, 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 I'm a surgeon, you know, I don't want to carry a hepatitis B infection in me and then potentially give it to my patient with the needle stick injuries or whatever. Or if my immunity is low, I could get it from my patient as well and so on. So the uh, understanding about who is immune, how long does the immunity last, mm -hmm. and those things become relevant as well. So testing is very, 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 very relevant even now. Let's not diminish that, sir. but then it was very critical early on because then we could have had probably lesser impact. We probably would have lost a lot less lives than we are now or we are projected to in the coming months uh, with, with the uh, availability of rampant testing, let's say in January or February. Let me ask, as close to the scene as you are, being that you're A, a physician and uh, practicing and doing your own research um how likely is it do you feel that in in at least the united states that this year uh sports arenas will be filled again and concert halls will be filled again uh and that the general public should feel safe and i, I know this is a, a it's speculation so i don't mean to be putting you on the spot but just your your gut sense as well as the science as you're looking at it any sense at all as to when you think, generally speaking, the public should feel safe again in those large mass crowd gatherings? The vaccine is the answer. Vaccine is the answer. Vaccine takes, uh, you know, initially when we started talking about it, 12 to 18 months. And now there are four trials with vaccine. But we're going to fast track vaccine that means we're going to put more people who are taking vaccine under risk or how we won't know there are a lot of vaccines coming up a lot of vaccines are being not coming up are being trialed or being developed we got to find the best possible vaccine and that takes at least six months of the bare minimum nobody's going to come up with a virus in six of a vaccine in six months but it's going to at least take six months i may be contradicting the way when i'm saying that but it is it's not going to happen in six months. So your sense is until, now, there, until there's a vaccine that's proven and reliable, you, you sense that there will be a pause in that aspect of our lives as far as gathering in these big condensed crowd uh, environments. You know, uh, uh, without uh, saying an S or no to that answer, one of the big worry is what is the surge when we remove or relax the restrictions? Because right now we know Hong Kong 
has a sudden surge in infections when they have relaxed the restrictions. Mm -hmm. It's a little puzzling to me, why isn't that happening in China? Because Wuhan opened up. Why yes. isn't that happening in Wuhan? Or are we going to say that in the next coming weeks? Yes. So time will answer that. Time yes. will answer that. Because, but there's a lot of worry. Uh, 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 like I said, doctors, healthcare systems are terrified of this virus. Literally, we were caught with our pants down on this. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so uh, uh, there's a lot of factor built in, into this. I'm very optimistic, very optimistic. You know, I, I, I probably I would say, let us prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how we should look at it. I always, uh, uh, you know, when the expectation that this is, a, you know, when you talk to patients a lot, you become a little philosophical. You know, uh, when I say to my patients, I tell them, you know, expectations are high. There's a lot of room for disappointment. When the expectations are low, there are less room for disappointment for all of us. So let us prepare for the worst and uh, hope for the best. And that way, if we find some miraculous cure in the next coming weeks, and we can get this all sorted and a vaccine in six months, maybe even before the end of the year, we are back to our regular life. Well, the, Dr. Ayub, with that being said, you know, I just want to thank you so much uh, for your uh, knowledge and insight uh, for our listeners and, and, and us uh, on this podcast. And uh, the way I, I like to conclude, and I've been doing this uh, ever since uh, this, uh, we've had COVID-19 and we've been doing these podcasts, is I'd like to get uh, a pearl from, uh, for, I would like to get it from you and uh, uh, Mr. Newmark as well. Uh, on this current pandemic. So uh, is there a pearl that you would like to, to give us or give our listeners, uh, Dr. Ayub? I'd like you to go first. The pearl is, you know, simple. The virus does not move. We move the virus. So the lesser we move, the lesser virus is going to infect others. That's why all the social restrictions are. And Apart from our social obligation, there is significant amount of personal benefit. Yes, we are all at the risk of going to get infected. If you are smart, you will get infected six months down the lane when the curve is flat and going down rather than the peak of the curve. So if you want to do that, you've got to follow all the social distancing guidelines personal hygiene guidelines, all that's being told to you every day in the TV, at workplace, everywhere. So let's not move the virus more. Thank you, Dr. Ayub. That's a, that's a great statement. I think we should all continue the social distancing and, and make sure that we're, we're doing our part to, to stop the spread of this. Uh, Fred, do you have something to say uh, to us as well, a, a pearl to add to our listeners or to give our listeners to to hold close to their mind in their mind and hearts well this may be more for the heart uh, Andy um, so I've been in healthcare for 17 years I'm not a physician but my experience in healthcare is one through the spectrum of business so I've worked um, in the recruiting space consulting space worked for a large health care system for 10 years and whether you deliver care and are a physician, a nurse, a provider of some sort, there is a business component to it. Uh, if you recruit physicians and providers, there is a business component to it. If you are a hospital system or a standalone hospital, profit or nonprofit, doesn't matter, there is a business component because business has its place for every enterprise. But what this has really brought to my attention is what healthcare is really all about. The kind of work that Dr. Ayub is doing and his colleagues and the frontline workers and the nurses and the people that just sweep up at the, at the all levels of a hospital that are keeping the systems up and running and, and sanitized and clean. Um, that's what healthcare is really about. So I have made a point, because I talk to quite a few doctors every week and I've made a point of taking a minute as we've done in the past in the military times when we see a 
um, someone in the military in the airport, we might take a time, whether it's just a thought or we actually take a, a moment to speak with them, to thank them for protecting us and keeping us out of harm's way. And so I'll take this second to thank Dr. Ayub for why he went into healthcare and what he's actually doing and delivering every single day that he's working on the front lines and to the people that he's around. And I think that's my, my pearl, that it's reminded me that healthcare is far from just a business and that healthcare workers and frontline people are, are doing their best, risking their lives to keep us safe each and every day right now. So that's from my heart to say, Dr. Ayub, thank you for, for the care that you're providing for everybody in your community. Well said, uh, Fred. And uh, gentlemen, the, a two amazing pearls uh, for our listeners. And with that, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us today for this podcast. I would like to especially thank Dr. Ayub, uh, Mr. Newmark, and of course, Jennifer and Dylan as well. Uh, I'd like to also encourage everyone to stay safe, continue social distancing, uh, enjoy time with your families, and uh, we'll all get through this uh, difficult time together. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. To subscribe to additional SMA podcasts, please visit sma.org forward slash podcasts.